Are you all awake? Good. This is your SmackDown review for Friday, June 23rd, 2023. I am a very sleepy solemn monster. This is a very boring episode of SmackDown. I, I just don't I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Sometimes they're hot, sometimes they're cold. But I think if tonight illustrates anything, it's just how important the Bloodline storyline has been to this show. When the Bloodline storyline, you have like a kind of an off week, which is what this week was, even in terms of, of that story, you know, they're talking about the Bloodline Civil War heading into Money in the Bank. There was no Roman Reigns on the show tonight. We got an Usos promo, Solo Sokoa in the main event. So we had some Bloodline movement here, but nothing terribly exciting. And when there's nothing exciting going on with the bloodline, man, is this show a fucking bore. Holy shit. Now, I don't know if this had anything to do with it or not. I I'm not going to lay it all at the man's feet, but it is time to dust off the old video. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is Vince Watch. It is Vince Watch. Apparently, plans for SmackDown changed over the course of the day, and those changes left. More than a few WWE superstars very frustrated because I assume their matches were changed, their matches were cut. We had a triple threat match that was advertised for tonight with Santos Escobar, LA Knight, and Butch. That did not happen. We had a match between Bailey and Shotzi that did not take place. I will thank Vince McMahon for that. That is one positive change on the show tonight. We did not need to see Bailey against Shotzi. It was going to be Bailey and Shotzi with Bailey's Money in the Bank spot on the line. So if Bailey were to lose the match, she would be out of Money in the Bank. I'm actually grateful that that got changed. But apparently this was one of those nights where Vince McMahon, his paws were all over the show. And a lot of people behind the scenes were very upset. Not as upset as I was watching this show. I don't really have a lot to say. Top line, try to boil down the top line stuff at the beginning, and there really is no top line stuff to boil down to. So we may as well just get right into it. Like I said, this is your SmackDown review for June 23rd. I hope your day Look is going better Richie than this show Rich was. Look over here dropping all this money on me. Hey, Look at this. I just want you to know, I think you rock. I don't mean the rock, a rock, you rock. And I just wanted you to know that. That is Paul Hamilton, the Portland pop star, coming in for the save here on this stream tonight. Paul, I, I did not know if you were with us tonight or not. And I am not in the best of moods because this show was not very good. But you, my friend, came through in a big way, and I want to say thank you for that. Paul Hamilton dropping a $100 super chat, saying, hopefully this will help ease your pain. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Paul Paul always is 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 there. He's always there for the pick me up. Always there to lift my spirits. He knows just what to do. Well, hit that subscribe button, as I always like to say here at the beginning. Hit the like button. I was I'm looking for 400 likes. I have no idea if we're actually gonna hit that tonight or not. But if you want, be the booker. 400 is the goal. So I'm just putting it out there. This may end up being a quick stream, but uh, 400 is the goal for Be The Booker. And of course, uh, channel memberships are open as always. So let's just dive right into it, shall we? Because the show tonight opened with a recap of the great closing angle. I guess sometimes when you peak, it's hard to kind of reach the same heights when you have a great angle like we did at the end of SmackDown last week. Where Jay Uso made his choice. Jay Uso made his decision. And they showed all the highlights here of him super kicking Roman Reigns and the Usos leaving the bloodline. This was the same video they aired on uh, Raw Monday night. Great stuff. And they spliced in photos too with the real dramatic music playing in the background as Jay was speaking, talking about Jimmy being the prom king and all these things when they were kids and they spliced in the old photos. So I thought that was done very well. But we had the Usos out to the ring to a, a very hot reaction, and they were all smiles. They looked like the weight of the world had been lifted off their shoulders after what happened at the end of SmackDown last week. Jay said that they're about to fight their family. 
and money in the bank. He said that that's not how it's supposed to work because families are supposed to lift each other up. You know, like uh, Paul just lifted me up here on the street. Families are supposed to lift you up from the bottom to the top and carry each other. Jimmy told him, look, you made the absolute right decision last week. Jay admitted that they still love Roman Reigns, and they could forgive him. But where he messed up was when he disrespected him and his brother. That was a bridge too far. Disrespecting Jimmy and Jay is ultimately what did Roman Reigns in. Jimmy said that respect is huge, and they were part of the most dominant faction in WWE, but once Roman stopped showing the Usos respect, they left Roman Reigns on the island of relevancy all by himself. Jay called out forces from the outside of the family, forces from outside the circle for driving a wedge between them, and more specifically, he was calling out Paul Heyman when he said that. And he called Paul Heyman a snake, said that his lies have driven their family apart. He said there would be a bloodline civil war at Money in the Bank, and that everybody was looking at the best tag team in the world. Jay said at Money in the Bank, it is lockdown. And he and Jimmy welcomed Solo, Sokoa, and Roman Reigns to the Uso Penitentiary. A decent little promo here, nothing to write home about, nothing special. Very, very uh, basic follow-up to the angle from last week. We are heading into Roman and Solo against the Usos and Money in the Bank, which... I still maintain, will lead us to Roman and Jey Uso at SummerSlam. I think that's the main event that uh, they are going to do for the championship. I mean, they could always do a four-way with all four members of the of the bloodline, but, you know, how, how do you get there? How, how do you get to a point where Jay will wrestle Jimmy? Jimmy will wrestle Jay. Solo will wrestle Roman. Because I, I, don't, I don't see them pulling the trigger just yet on Solo turning against Roman Reigns. I still feel like that's something, if anything, you say for SummerSlam. So I think Roman and Jay one-on-one is still the likeliest main event. Then we had Rey Mysterio one-on-one with LA Knight. This was a change from the original match that was announced. The original match that was advertised for the show tonight was a triple threat match with three members of the Money in the Bank lineup next weekend. LA Knight, Santos Escobar, and Butch. So we got word late in the day that this got changed. This got vinced. And it was changed to one-on-one Rey Mysterio against LA Knight. I thought these two were having a a fine match. About midway through, all of a sudden, the crowd starts chanting, this is awesome. I wouldn't say it was awesome. It was nice that the crowd thought so. I didn't think it was awesome. Uh, It definitely was not awesome by the time it was over, though. But like I said, it was nice that the crowd thought so. Ray went for another 619. Knight, though, caught his legs. Then things fell apart. This is where things fell apart at this point. For the closing sequence of the match, these two were just not on the same page. Uh, just a lot of clumsiness with, with some of the spots they were trying to do. And you know that Ray is not going to be the one getting the blame for this. Ray Mysterio can go out there and wrestle a fucking broomstick. You know Rey Mysterio is not going to be the one, if anybody gets bitched out for this, he's not going to be the one to take the heat for what happened here at the end of this match. Finally, though, Knight just hit the Blunt Force Trauma, which is his finish, out of nowhere, and he pinned Rey clean in the middle of the ring. Well, not in the middle. They were close to the ropes. But he pinned Rey Mysterio clean 1-2-3 to win the match. After the match was over, Knight attempted to rip off uh, Risterio, I just fused their two names together. That's kind of funny. He tried to rip off Rey Mysterio's mask. Santos Escobar sprinted down to the ring to make the save. LA Knight bailed out to the floor and chased him away. That is a big win for LA Knight. Let's start with the positive here. LA Knight got a win. I even said to somebody in the live chat here as the show was going on that, you know, Vince making a change to the match, all would be forgiven if LA Knight walks away with the win. And he did. He did. And he won clean. And he beat Rey Mysterio. So for LA Knight, that's a huge win uh, heading into Money in the Bank. But it is very unfortunate that the match turned into such a slop fest at the end. And my fear, and, and genuinely, my fear is that 
you know, Vince McMahon is going to watch what we saw at the end of this match. He's going to watch the closing sequence of this match. He's going to put all the blame on LA Knight. He's going to sour on him. And whatever push they have, possibly, planned for him, whatever push that he may be uh, potentially in line for, uh, could go poof. And if you don't think that's possible, then you're ignoring how petty this man can be. This is the same man who once walked out at a live event at the Nassau Coliseum during a match between Rhino and I want to say Tajiri. Walked out in the middle of the match, told them to get the fuck out of the ring. He didn't say fuck, but he basically called the match off and said get out of here because he didn't like the match. And we've heard countless stories over the years about people who get heat for one stupid thing or another or they have one bad night in the ring. Look at what happened. Buff Bagwell had a bad night against Booker T in Tacoma, Washington, and it blew up the entire invasion. The entire WCW invasion plan that WWE had was blown up by one bad match in the main event of Raw in Tacoma, Washington. So if you don't think that having one bad night could blow up someone's career or blow up their push, you haven't been paying attention. It feels like they've been putting LA Knight on television, and I can't even say they're pushing him. The crowd is reacting to him. What push has he really been getting from WWE? He's getting television time, which is good. He's part of the Money in the Bank match, which is great. He should win Money in the Bank this year. He's certainly in contention. He certainly has to be one of the favorites going into next Saturday. But I can't sit here and say, oh, he's been getting that push that LA Knight's been getting. It's almost like the crowd has been pushing him in spite of the way that he's been used on WWE television. So sometimes all it takes is just one bad match or one bad night to sour the important people, the only people who really matter, to sour them on you. And it could change someone's career. So hopefully I'm just, you know, overreacting for nothing. But when this was over, that was my first thought. On a night where Vince McMahon clearly made his presence felt and changed different things on the show and cut things from the show, you know he was watching this match. You know he couldn't have been happy with the finish of this match. If they're just looking for a reason to go, you know what, this guy, he just doesn't have it. All they'd have to do is point to a a couple of botches at the end here, and that's the end of LA Night. So I, I'm really hoping that's not the case. Uh, but it was it was an important win for him. And I was glad that he uh, was able to uh, pick up the win. I don't know if he was in line to win the uh, triple threat match that was originally scheduled, if he was going to win that match too. Uh, I would guess so. You know, maybe the outcome wasn't really changed here. Uh, but this was a change for the better. Uh, look, I think that triple threat would have been a very good match. But L.A. Knight beating Rey Mysterio one-on-one, that was a positive change. That was a positive change. And if that was a Vince McMahon change, then good. I'm just happy to see the man pick up a big, clean win. Now, backstage after this, Paul Heyman was walking with Solo Sokoa when Ridge Holland, who had his phone in his hand, he passed by right in front of them, and then he turned and he looked at Solo and he asked him, what are you looking at? And Solo Sokoa reacted with a Samoan spike. Gave him a Samoan spike right to the throat, put him down. Paul Heyman then called into his phone. He called for Roman Reigns as he walked away. After the break, Ridge was still down in the back having trouble breathing. Adam Pierce was there at one of the doctors. Sheamus told Pierce he wanted Solo, and he walked off. He walked out into the arena, no music. He interrupted an on-camera with the announcers at the announce desk. And Sheamus said that tonight he was going to give Solo the fight of his life. And then he left. And a few segments later, Michael Cole made the announcement that it was made official. Our main event tonight would be Sheamus going one-on-one with Solo Sokoa. Having hope is a mistake, says Maze the Great. I am not overreacting. I I know. That's my fear. I'm not overreacting here. I think we all know how petty these people can be. We all know how petty these people can be. But uh, I think L.A. Knight, he can, he, can overcome, uh, he can overcome one bad night. Let us hope. We know how fickle these people can be. So then we had a unification match for the WWE Women's Tag Team titles and the NXT Women's Tag Team Championships because we have no use for two sets of women's tag team titles on the main roster, so we're going to unify them. It 
It's Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler defending their WWE Women's Tag Team titles against Alba Fire and Isla Dawn, the defending NXT Women's Champions. The winners will be able to defend the unified titles across all three brands. They made that very clear. That includes NXT, which is honestly the way that it should have been with the main women's tag team title. That's how it was initially with the WWE Women's Tag Team titles. I'm pretty sure we had Sasha and Bayley when they were champions. I, I think they may have made a, a pit stop in NXT. But or I, may be, I may be thinking of something else, but we have not seen the WWE women's tag team titles uh, on NXT in a very long time. Now, though, that the, the titles have been unified, they made it clear it should be defended across all three brands. So they showed Raquel Rodriguez. Monday Night Raw's Raquel Rodriguez. She was sitting at ringside observing the match. We were not told why. Alba and Isla, they were dominant early in the match. Isla Dawn landed a running Meteora. Alba Fire made a cover for a two. Shayna recovered. She shoved Dawn from the top rope. Rousey then hit a Poison Rana on Alba Fire heading into the commercial break. Ronda Rousey is out here hitting fucking Poison Ranas on the show. Rousey had an ankle lock on Alba, but she broke free. Isla Dawn and Shayna Baszler, they ended up in the ring. Isla went up for a top rope Meteora, and she landed awkwardly. This did not look good. I don't know if she slipped or she just sort of underjumped or what it was. Her knees basically ended up in, in Shayna's midsection or <laughs> nether region. Uh, this, this did not look great. Baszler was able to come back, though, with a Kirifuda clutch. Alba broke things up with a swanton, then took out Rousey with a dive on the floor. Moments later, Shayna got the Kirifuda clutch applied to Alba. Ronda climbed back in the ring. She cut off Isla when she tried to make the save, and then took her down, got her locked in an armbar, and the NXT Women's Tag Team Champions tapped out simultaneously. We had simultaneous submissions here at the end of this match. Thanks for coming. You're new. Unified Women's Tag Team Champions Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler, and you know what that means. Get ready for Ronda Rousey on Tuesdays, because now she's going to be able to appear on all three brands. To the surprise of no one, Ronda and Shayna unify the tag team titles. Now, after the match, Raquel got up. Raquel was walking to the back, and Ronda gets on the mic, and she says, Why are you even here? Raquel gets up on the apron and she says, we want a rematch for those tag team titles. And Shayna asks, who is this we that you're talking about? And cue the returning Liv Morgan, who walked out wearing skimpy denim shorts. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Liv Morgan. Back on television here. All four women were in the ring. They had a brief stare down before Rousey and Baszler left the ring. The live return was uh, a nice surprise because I thought she was going to be out longer. They never actually told us the nature of the shoulder injury, uh, only that she had injured her shoulder. And I just sort of assumed that she's going to be gone probably for the rest of the summer. Maybe she needs surgery. Again, WWE never specified. So that's a good thing, that uh, she doesn't need surgery or anything like that. Alba and Isla, you know, look, they were the victims of poor timing more than anything else. They won the NXT Women's Tag Team titles not all that long ago. I believe, if I remember, it was uh, Kiana James and Fallon Henley. Uh, it might have been at the February, what was, I don't know if it was Stand and Deliver. It might have been Stand and Deliver. Uh, that they won those those tag team titles. So they had them for a couple of months, probably. And then they got called up. Actually, last month they got called up. And once words started getting around, the WWE was considering a unification. And you see that Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler, only about a month ago, won the women's tag team titles. You knew what fate awaited them. It was only a matter of time. But the thing is, it was a necessary move. So it's kind of like, all right, well, you kind of weigh the pros and cons here. Do we need two sets of women's tag team belts? Absolutely not. It was the right move to unify the women's tag team titles. That was the correct move. But of course, it was going to be Ronda and Shayna. It was always going to be Ronda and Shayna. 
Alba and Isla have, this was maybe, maybe their third match. Second or third match on the main roster. They're not getting reactions when they come out. They haven't been established yet. They're still new to the main roster. But you knew that their time as champions was coming to an end here because they were victims of, of just poor timing. You know, had they held off on the unification, they would have had a longer run. But why do we need NXT Women's Tag Team Champions on the main roster? We don't. Did they really give any thought to this before they called these women up? Probably not. In a lot of these cases, I'm willing to bet these decisions were made very late in the game. I'm sure Shawn Michaels didn't have too much of a heads up on a lot of these moves either. I mean, look, we had the Raw Women's Champion on SmackDown, the SmackDown Women's Champion on Raw. For how long? Before they finally addressed the situation with the belts and they rebranded the belts? That also was a necessary move. Again, we now have uh, one unified set of women's tag team champions. We don't have a division. We have Raquel and Liv. We have Katana Chance and Caden Carter on Raw. They're a very good tag team. Too early, though, to see them uh, beating Ronda and Shayna. And beyond that, who do we have? We don't have anybody. We have nobody. I guess we have Chelsea Green and Sonya Deville. So what is that? Four teams I've named. We have a division with four teams. Congratulations. Very good. We got a Grayson Waller effect in the ring with Pretty Deadly, who are the number one contenders for the Undisputed Tag Team Championships. They're going to be facing Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn on SmackDown next Friday in London. Waller said that he was happy to have people with style on his show. Wilson put over London as the greatest city in the world. He said they were taking their title opportunity pretty deadly seriously. Ha, ha, ha. Ah. See, he's trying to be funny. Elton Prince then popped up and said Sammy and Kevin have huge egos, and they were surprised that Pretty Deadly became the number one contenders for the tag team titles. He asked what was surprising about that, because they had won gold in WWE before. They had done it on their debut match in NXT. They won the NXT tag team titles. He said they practically share the same brain and would be doing it for the next decade, dominating the tag team division. They ran through all of the teams they quote-unquote defeated in the gauntlet match on TV last week, even though they entered last. And they, they beat, uh, I guess it was the Brawling Brutes, who of course were, were weakened and exhausted by that point in the gauntlet. So then the Street Profits interrupted. They took exception to this. I don't know why they should take exception to this. They lost in the... First fucking round of the gauntlet match last week. They got beaten less than three minutes. I'd talk shit about them too if I were pretty deadly. But the Street Profits came out. They said we're here to introduce them to the smoke. We want the smoke. I thought this would never end. They, they did not give these two uh, very good material here. I thought this segment was never going to end. But it did lead into our next match, which was pretty deadly taking on the Street Profits. After a commercial, Kit Wilson was in control. He was working over Montez Ford. The two of them came off the top rope. Ford, though, turned in midair, and he fell on top of him. Ford got the hot, do the, uh, hot dog. Yeah, he got the hot dog. He got the hot tag. You know what? I'm thinking of that first Super Chat that came in. Somebody asked me about the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest, and now I got fucking hot dogs on the brain. So he got the hot tag to Angelo Dawkins. Dawkins came in to clean house. Dawkins landed a double underhook slam for two. Prophet set up for something. I don't know what it was, but they were setting up for something. Wilson broke it up. Prince then rolled up Dawkins. It got a little help from his partner. He got a little help from Wilson on the outside, which the referee did not see. And pretty deadly pick up the win. And they zoomed in on Angelo Dawkins' face. His eyes were bugging out of his head. He couldn't believe it. He looked like he was about to snap. He should. He should. This was uh, an average match. But it was a momentum-building match for uh, Pretty Deadly, a momentum-building win for Prince and Wilson ahead of their tag team title match next week. Something needs to change very soon for Montez Ford and Angelo Dawkins. There has been talk, there has been chatter now for a little while of a heel turn for one or both of them. I hope for their sake it happens sooner than later because these two, these two are... Not just treading water right now. They have fallen into the deep end without any life vests. 
and they're trying to doggy paddle and stay keep their head above water. I guess they're taking their time. I, again, I don't know if they will turn as a team. I don't know if one will turn on the other. Because if you'll notice, a lot of these matches, if not all of these matches, it's typically Dawkins is the one taking the losing fall. It's not very often you see Montez Ford is the one being pinned. It's usually Angelo Dawkins, which makes him, in storyline, in theory, the weak link of the team. And they again, they zoomed in on his face with the big eyes at the end of the match. I'm sure they did that on purpose. There's a reason for that. So I don't know if they're going to split them. I don't know if the entire team is going to turn heel. Either way, a heel turn has to be in the cards. Because if it's not, then boy, I, I don't know what to say about what we have seen from the Street Profits over the last couple of months, you know, since WrestleMania. They have not had a very good uh, go of it. Their luck, they've been down on their luck. Something has to change with these two. Then, it was the match that absolutely nobody asked for. Well, actually, I take that back. There was one person who asked for it. There was one person who asked for it. We all know who that was. We all know who that was. Charlotte Flair, one-on-one. -on -one with Lacey Evans. Oh yes. Remember that short-lived feud before Lacey got pregnant and they had to put the the whole thing on the back burner? Well, we revisited it tonight. This was not good. Charlotte hit Evans with some chops. Evans fought back by whipping Charlotte to the ground by her hair. Female Sergeant Slaughter then got up on the ropes, the second rope she was demanding that the crowd salute her. Charlotte hit Evans with an overhead throw, and then she did the Andrade Tranquilo pose. That was the most amusing part of the entire match, was Charlotte doing the Andrade pose. And then she kipped up to her feet. Charlotte held on. Uh, she applied the figure eight, had the hold locked in. Lacey Evans tapped out. Charlotte held on to the figure eight until Asuka hit the ring and kicked her in the head to break the hold. She stomped on her a few more times. She danced around a little bit before leaving, and the piped-in boos were clashing with what sounded like cheers for Asuka. So we had sort of a, a weird soundtrack here for this. But uh, look, Vincenzo finally got closure on the feud that he was very disappointed he didn't have a chance to finish. The feud, this was the, this was the big ending this was the closure that he has been yearning for for the last couple of years finally between charlotte and lacy the old man got what he wanted next friday charlotte is going to be challenging oscar for the women's championship bianca belair had promised last week that she would be ringside for that match because she wants to make absolutely sure that adam pierce does not sneak in somebody you know in line in front of her she already was supposed to get the match Charlotte showed up. She got the match instead. She wants to make sure nothing like that happens again. So what happened here on this show, there was a backstage segment where Adam Pierce told Bianca, look, I am banning you from ringside next week. Because she was asking her, you know, what if one of the participants tries to provoke you? What if they, what if they put their hands on you? Are you going to fight back? And she said, yeah, of course I'm going to fight back. Of course I'm going to fight back. I'm going to defend myself. And he said, therein lies the problem. He can't have that. So he banned Bianca Belair from coming out to the ring next week during the match. He just could not take the risk that one of these women might provoke her. Bianca was not very happy about that, and she walked off. Doesn't mean that she still won't show up and factor into the finish. I, I still think Bianca will be involved in some way, uh, but she will not be there during the actual match. The main event, mercifully, we're already up to the main event here. 30 minutes into the review, we're up to the main event. That tells you right there how exciting this fucking show was tonight. I'm 30 minutes in. I'm already up to the main event. We had Sheamus one-on-one -on -one with Solo Sokoa. Sheamus tried an early brogue kick before Sokoa rolled out to the floor. Sheamus went for the 10 beats. Sokoa was uh, on the apron, but Solo blocked it. On the apron, Sheamus lifted him up. Sokoa, though, fought out, rammed Sheamus into the ring post. Solo then hit a Samoan drop on the outside as the show went to a break. Now, back from the final break, Sheamus landed the clubbing blows to the chest on the apron. This time he got it. He fired up the crowd. He was setting up for the brogue kick, but Solo intercepted him with a super kick. Sheamus hit the ropes and then landed a running knee strike for a close near fall. Sheamus attempted to lift up Solo, but his back gave out. But 
On the second attempt, he got him up, and he delivered white noise for an ear fall. He then set up for a Celtic cross, but again, his back gave out on him. Solo landed a Samoan uh, spike. Sheamus, though, fell out of the ring. So Solo went out after him. He gave him a urinage on top of the announce desk. Solo then placed Sheamus up against the barricade. So Sheamus is down. He's up against the barricade, and Solo gets a running start, and he comes charging in with a hip attack that clearly missed. And he collapsed the barricade anyway by the timekeeper's area. Referee Jessica Carr comes over. And she has seen such devastation here from this running uh, hip attack that she calls an end to the match. She's calling the match off. Sheamus is in such a bad way that he simply cannot continue. Now, they did this, obviously, to protect Sheamus by not pinning him in this match. In the end, though, I don't think it did much to protect him because the spot just looked bad. It looked so bad, and the fact that they called the match off, even though the spot looked, te the, the spot looked terrible, uh, it, I don't know how much that really protected Sheamus in the end. After the match, Solo tossed around some trainers. He was losing his mind, right? He was just on edge after what happened at the end of SmackDown last week. Adam Pierce comes out, he tries to get the situation under control, when all of a sudden we hear the Usos music. And the Usos hit the ring, they deliver super kicks to Solo, they finally put him down with a double super kick, and they close the show by hitting a double Uso splash, and I don't think I have ever seen this before. And the Usos are a great team, and we've seen them do this spot many, many times before. The Usos go up for the double Uso splash, and they both missed. I have no idea how that happened. I have no clue. You would think at least one of them would actually land on top of Solo's body. Because I can understand maybe if they're coming down at the same moment, you know, they want to avoid hitting each other on the way down, so one of them hits, the other one maybe doesn't. Somehow they both miss. This spot looked like shit. A double splash, and neither guy actually splashes the other person. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I honestly don't. Put this show in the rearview mirror. This is a SmackDown that is better off forgotten. This was a thumbs down show tonight. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Dre Hund with a $25 Bree Mode Super Chat. Right as I was saying thumbs down. If that, if that isn't a sign, I don't know what is. Dre Hunt, thank you. <sighs> this show felt like a complete waste of time. This show felt like they were just buying time until we get to London next week for the, for the big SmackDown episode because they got two championship matches coming up next week. So that's what this felt like. This felt like, man, we got to get through this week somehow. And I, look, this is not a Vince McMahon thing. I don't know all of the changes that Vince McMahon made to this show tonight, right? As I said, we're on Vince Watch, right? Because clearly there were changes made tonight. The two changes, the two obvious changes, I thought were positive changes. I had no interest in watching Bailey against Shotzi. So thank you for that. And then LA Knight ends up getting the spotlight on him one-on-one -on -one against Rey Mysterio, even though the finish got fucked. He gets a win. As long as he got a win, that's okay with me. So I can't even sit here and say, oh my God, the show is so much worse because of Vince McMahon. Here's the deal. The show every single week, if it's not booked by Vince McMahon, it's approved by Vince McMahon. Vince is here every single week. It just so happens that certain weeks, he meddles in the show a little more than usual, and we hear about people being frustrated, matches being cut. We don't need backstage gossip to see that there were two fucking matches that got upended tonight. Okay, we can see that with our own two eyes. They're in the preview. All of a sudden, they're not in the preview. WWE puts tweets out. All of a sudden, the tweets are gone. Where'd they go? I don't know. Obviously, changes were made. But this is not a Vince McMahon thing. This is just a SmackDown thing. And this has been going on for a while. And I think the quality of the Bloodline stuff has clouded people's judgment when it comes to SmackDown. SmackDown, I've, I've said for a long time, for many, many months, that SmackDown was the A show. And the reason SmackDown was the A show was because they have the A storyline. Not just in WWE, but in all of wrestling. The Bloodline stuff has been largely fantastic. And the Bloodline's home is on Friday nights. And so therefore, SmackDown on most weeks is going to be 
the better show because they have the bloodline and because the show is two hours instead of three. And it's a lot easier to sit through a two-hour show than it is a three-hour show. And even when you get a bad SmackDown, I'd rather sit through a two-hour bad SmackDown than a three-hour bad, boring Raw. So that already gives SmackDown a leg up on, on the Monday night show. But you take out the Bloodline stuff, and this is one of those weeks where we can really see this. The Bloodline stuff on the show tonight, it was fine. It was not terribly exciting. They, they weren't going to be able to do anything that was going to match the level of what we saw last week, right? That was the peak. That was the big climactic, uh, you know, turn in this angle to get the Usos out of the Bloodline. Now we head to Money in the Bank and the big Civil War. So this week, what are they going to do? Roman's not there, okay? So we had a very basic... Storyline with the bloodline tonight where Solo Sokoa was trying to stand up for the bloodline. He got put down at the end of the show. So we had a very ho-hum night for that. So now the bloodline stuff is not really exciting tonight. Let's look at what else we have tonight. And you look at the rest of this show, and there's just there's just nothing there. There's no other story currently on this show. There were certainly no matches tonight. I mean, the main event was good, but there were no matches that you could point to tonight to be like oh man what a fuck you gotta look if you miss smackdown tonight you gotta go out of your way to watch this match no there was nothing like that on the show but there's no other story currently going on right now that can really hook you in and reel you in the way that the bloodline does so when that stuff is it kind of has an off week it really highlights how bad things can be on the smackdown brand this was not a good show. I had people who were trying again to tell me tonight on my fucking timeline, you know, they, they probably saw the early results of the Twitter poll and immediately they were attacking the people. Oh, you know, of course, people hear that Vince is making changes and automatically the show is a thumbs down show. No, the show is a thumbs down show because the show is a fucking bore. Regardless of the changes Vince McMahon made, I actually thought they were positive changes and the show was still a fucking bore. It's okay to say that the show is a fucking bore. You can take your tongue off the boot. You don't have to lick the boot all day. You can see the show for what it is. It's okay to admit that this was not a very good episode of SmackDown. But I'm sure that makes me an AEW show. Until the next time I have some critique about AEW. Then I'll be back to carrying water for WWE. I'm always confused exactly what which pail of water I'm supposed to be picking up here. So it was fascinating to see some of those comments online tonight. I, I just cannot, I just, I just can't understand why it's so hard for people to bring themselves to admit when the show is boring that the show is just not as good as it has been previously. There was nothing here. Nothing. And this show has a lot of weaknesses, and I said this going into WrestleMania. Triple H is going to have a real tall order ahead of him coming out of Mania whenever the bloodline angle starts to really, you know, kind of die down or the bloodline angle comes to an end. What the hell are they going to do on Friday nights? What are they going to do? How are they going to replace this? This is why they probably want to drag this bloodline thing out for another year. Because they know that when the bloodline is over, they got nothing. They don't have anything in their back pocket. They don't have anything brewing on the show right now that even comes close to this level of storytelling. How come the bloodline is the only story in this company that can get three years worth of build? Is there no other story they can start building with all the other talent they have on this show? There are frustrated talents on this show. Case in point, you know, Sheamus was in the main event tonight. And I wanted to bring this up, but Sheamus did an interview just recently. He did an interview with uh, the Metro. And one of the topics that was discussed included his thoughts that WWE has not capitalized on the Brawling Brutes as a group in the company. And this is what Sheamus had to say about the Brawling Brutes. He said, I just don't think they've really capitalized on the group. I don't think they've really let us show what we can do. The stop and start stuff is really hard when you're trying to highlight young talent. It's frustrating, you know? So I don't know, maybe we'll get an opportunity to show what we can really do as a group because a lot of those other groups who are out there right now have definitely got an opportunity that we have not had to do, uh, that we have not had rather, to do some storyline stuff, some character stuff. That's kind of been a shame, to be honest, considering the talent that's there. 
I've always tried to get the boys involved. There's just a lot of creative stuff that's out of my hands. They kind of got sidelined on that, which shouldn't have been the case. Especially the history we have with Drew. There was a great opportunity to tell a story there of Drew coming back into the fold and the boys being apprehensive about that happening. They're young, they're hungry, they've wanted to do this their whole lives. Ridge has been a fan of wrestling his entire life. Butch has been doing this from a young age. Sitting on the sidelines, especially when you're passionate and you know you're talented and you know you can go, there's nothing more frustrating. It could have been better. And honestly, I mean, you could say that a lot about various characters and various acts in WWE. This could have been better. They should have capitalized on this sooner. If we look at the Brawling Brutes, right, they had a little thing going there for, I think, briefly, or there was a match or something with the Bloodline. There was a little something there for, for a brief period of time with the Bloodline. The Bloodline is, you know, if you want to look at it like a dinner menu, the Brawling Brutes are an appetizer, and the Bloodline is the main course. And the bloodline will continue to be the main course for many more months to come, even though the bloodline now is basically down to three people. After working with the bloodline, and you could say that they could have done more with that, but like, where do you go with the brawling brutes as far as as a trio feuding with another group? You have the LWO. The problem is both groups are baby faces. So there really isn't another strong group for them to work with right now on the SmackDown brand. Now, I think the point that Sheamus makes about doing more character stuff, and he mentions the idea with Drew, when he and Drew suddenly were friends again, and he was kind of almost like an honorary member of the Brawling Brutes there for a while. You know, he talked about there being the p potential for them to do character stuff where the other two were jealous, maybe, of Drew, you know, kind of muscling into the group. And... Yeah, that's an interesting idea. It probably would have ended up turning some of them heel. Um, but again, it just goes to show you that there are very real creative frustrations. And it doesn't mean that it has to be a, a hateful thing where they, or, you know, we're going to leave when our contracts are up. But yeah, there are, there are going to be those times where you just feel like the company isn't doing anything with you. Where you're just kind of drifting around aimlessly. This is one of the reasons why Drew McIntyre has not come back yet. You know, we've been reading about McIntyre now ever since WrestleMania, and he has so far refused to come back because he wants a clear sense of what his creative is going to be when he comes back. Because he does not want to end up like the Brawling Brutes, where he just, he's back, and he doesn't have any real story, and he's just sort of wandering around aimlessly. So supposedly one of the holdups in bringing him back, and he may be back in the next couple of weeks, but one of the, the holdups in him coming back, other than, you know, I know his... Uh, sister-in-law passed away recently has been the fact that I want to know creatively what do you have planned for me and if I don't like what you have planned or you don't have anything planned for me then I am not coming back so here in this case a rare instance where Seamus who has been with this company for many years is publicly vocally uh letting people know, hey, you know, I've been pretty frustrated by this because I feel like the company's dropped the ball. You know, to do something with the Brawling Brutes, though, who do they work with? You know, what do you do? Butch. Let's say Butch just as a quick example here. Could WWE be doing more with Butch? Yes. Could they be fleshing his character out more? Could he be doing more speaking so we actually get to hear from him? Yes. And I think there was a happy medium between Pete Dunne, just being Pete Dunne, and the Butch stuff, where it looked like he was you know, a fucking dog with rabies running around. I think there's a happy medium between the two. But they haven't done any character stuff with Butch. Butch comes out, and he just goes after people, and that's it. He's like the attack dog of the group. But it's, it's just very one-dimensional. There, there's no layers to the character. There's no story there. Seamus probably looks at the bloodline and says, hey, you know, this story stuff is getting over. How come we can't have a story? And that's what I mean, to go back to the point I made before. The bloodline stuff is, is not going to last forever. WWE should be taking great pains with, with the brawling brutes and with other acts on the show to start developing actual compelling stories. There are none. Other than Roman Reigns and Solo and the Usos, there are no compelling stories on this show. And I would say the same thing about Monday Night Raw. And I like the Judgment Day, right? 
What is the compelling story, though, on Monday Night Raw right now? I don't know, but you know what? For a company that really thrives on storytelling and we tell stories and everything, they don't have very many of them going on right now that are of any great interest. They have their one. That one story is going to come to an end at some point. Then what do you do? That's what they should be worried about. Now, SmackDown next Friday has the return of Roman Reigns. Tribal Chief is back on SmackDown in London next week. By the way, they're going to be taping that show earlier that day. So keep that in mind if you want to avoid spoilers next Friday, as is usually the case with these UK shows. It's going to air normal time in the States. That means they're taping it earlier in the afternoon. Charlotte will challenge Asuka for the Women's Championship. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn defend the tag team titles against Pretty Deadly. And we are getting another Grayson Waller effect. And his guest on the show next week will be none other than Logan Paul, who has his own show. He has his own podcast. So now he will appear on Grayson Waller's show next week. Will Grayson Waller ever wrestle on SmackDown? Where, where's Wrestle Rumble when we, when we need Wrestle Rumble? We need Wrestle Rumble to have a contest. We could all take bets. Will Grayson Waller ever actually step into the ring and wrestle on SmackDown? And if so, what month might we see him in action? Because this constant string of shows is uh, getting a little tiresome. Is he? Is there some stipulation in his contract that bars him from wrestling and doing the Grayson Waller effect? He's only allowed to do one or the other? He's not injured. I thought maybe he was hurt. He's not hurt. So when are we actually going to see this guy step into the ring, I wonder? Uh, There will be no review next Friday, just so you know. I will not be here. But uh, I will, of course, be here live next Saturday for the Money in the Bank review. That is airing at 3 o'clock Eastern time. So there will be no taped Money in the Bank. They're just going to air it at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast. So that will be a rare 3 p.m. pay-per-view with the live review immediately following. Here's the Twitter poll. 36% of you have given this show a smiley face. I did it a little bit different tonight. Instead of thumbs up, thumbs down, 36% of you have given this show a smile. 63% of you have given this show the, uh, the sleeping emoji. That was me tonight. That was me tonight watching SmackDown with the sleeping emoji. This was a tough show to sit through, man. Not an offensive show, but just just a boring show. What else can I say? What else can I say? I guess they can't all be winners now, can they? Let's get to your Super Chats here. This will probably put a bigger smile on my face than the show did tonight. We have got... Rob G. Rob G. Which belt looks better? This is the super chat I was making mention of before that I had on the brain when I mentioned Hot Dog. He said, which belt looks better, Roman's or the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest? So for those who don't know, the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest is an annual thing out in Coney Island here in Brooklyn. And they have an actual championship belt that is awarded to the winner. Uh, I... I meant to kind of bring the picture up here. I don't have it, but uh, if you go and take a a, a look at what the Nathan's hot dog eating belt looks like, it's actually a pretty nice looking belt. So I am going to say that the Nathan's hot dog belt looks nicer than Roman Reigns WWE Championship, which is kind of sad. Uh, Paul Hamilton, again, with that $100 bomb earlier, says hopefully this will help ease your pain. It did. It did just a little bit. Just a little bit. Paul, thank you. Rodimus Prime, glad I missed most of the show. Seeing Ronda and Shayna as the unified tag champs yawn. Uh, Christopher Smith, my internet went out. Then I had a power outrage. I don't know if you meant to, to, to write outrage or outage. I think you meant outage, but... I think to, I think for tonight's show, actually, that might be an appropriate way of describing it. I've had a few of those power outrages myself. And he says his furnace was flooding upstairs in his attic. Smackdown was boring, but oh well. Yeah, 
yeah, floods are not. I hope, uh, hope there wasn't too much damage, or if there was, you have insurance. I, I certainly hope. Uh, Rizzo with the $20 super chat. This might be a dumb question. Is WWE becoming a pay per view PLE only company? I personally have not watched a full Raw or SmackDown in years, and the PLEs do a great job catching everyone up. WWE seems to be on a good streak of having great must see PLEs, whereas the weekly shows you can miss, and if anything happens, you can watch clips on YouTube. Uh, so no, they are they are not going to be a PLE only company. They are in the process right now of negotiating a multi-billion dollar media rights package. Raw and SmackDown and NXT are very important to this company. Without that money, they're in a lot of trouble. So they are not a PLE only uh, company. Weekly television, whether it's streaming, whether it's on a network like USA or Fox, will always be there. It's basically like their weekly commercials. And there's a lot of commercials. It's their weekly commercial for the paper. That will that will never go away. That will never change. Uh, Joseph Brooks with the 999. Where the hell is Bobby Lashley? Is he injured? Also, since the bloodline seems to be on the brink of ending, could Lashley be the one to dethrone Roman? And they could have him drop it to Cody. No. Bobby Lashley is not going to beat Roman Reigns. And and if Cody Rhodes is going to win the championship, he should win it from Roman Reigns. He should not win it from Bobby Lashley. But uh, Bobby Lashley beating Roman is wishful thinking on your part. As far as where Lashley is, as far as I know, he's not hurt. So your guess is as good as mine. I have not heard anything about an injury. I just think that uh, they just don't have anything for him right now. Bobby's World with the $20 Super Chat. Hey, Bobby. Thank you, sir. I hope you're having a very good night. Bobby's World. And by the way, uh, I, I did set the goal tonight, the likes goal for 400. We are at 330, 336. So it looks like we might fall short. But, uh, get those likes up if you want to do uh, B2B in a little bit. Uh, Bobby's World says, My best friend's daughter graduated yesterday. No one will know the pain of both our families to get her there, as she suffers from severe anxiety issues. But we got her there, and yesterday was a very special day. Here's a second part here. When her name was called, she got her diploma, and then walked straight past the superintendent without shaking his hand as he lied through his teeth and almost didn't allow her to walk the stage. F that guy. That is pretty fucked up, actually. Uh, and then Bobby says, and now, and how am I celebrating by giving you $45 to tell the story? LOL. Love you, brother, and bless you for doing God's work. Well, Bobby, thank you, first of all, number one. Number two, that is a pretty shitty thing of uh, him to do. And uh, number three, congrats to your best friend's dog. She was able to overcome, at least for one day, that she was able to overcome her anxiety and walk that stage. That is very cool, but uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do... Wow. Renee says he missed SmackDown for the past 10 years. It's a long time. Keep it up with the uh, with the streams at least, right? That's all you need to do. You don't need to watch the show. You just keep up with the streams, and I'll I'll get you through. I mean, these shows are two or three hours, man. I'll get you through it in an hour or less. So that's really all you need. For being honest, uh, EJ Slamp, if Brett does not leave in 1997, how would you have broken up the Heart Foundation? That's a what if I don't ever hear people talking about at all. Well, it's funny you mentioned that I got a mailbag question from somebody. I'll probably end up using their question on the show on Sunday. And it kind of touches on that idea, so I, I'm kind of hesitant to to uh, to get into it. But it was an intriguing subject line in the email. It said, Bret Hart, the tribal chief. If that gives you a, a hint about what the nature of his question was. Um, 
So I'm, I I would almost rather wait and kind of get into that scenario on, on Sunday. But I mean, I, I'm not sure Brian Pillman would have been there, but the, the belief is Pillman was going to go back to WCW uh, had he not passed away. I guess maybe he just felt that was always his home base. and um, Evidently, he wanted to go back to WCW. I don't know if Vince would have allowed him. I don't know when his contract was up. So I, I don't know if he would have been part of the end of the Hart Foundation or not. But again, the uh, other idea I'll get into on Sunday. Uh, MH Nova, Yo Solo. Hope all is well. More likely title record to be broken. Roman over Bruno or Theory over Luger. Also, Solo, when is your first match? Well, when I have my first match, I am sure that I will promote it and you will all be made very aware. Right now, I am I am sticking to the commissionership. And that's all it is, right? Now, is the commissionership? Uh, I don't know offhand how many days was Luger the U.S. champ? Was it five hundred and something days, or it was probably longer than that, right? Roman is not beating Bruno, so you can forget about that. Roman is not beating Bruno. I don't think he's beating Hogan either, but he's got a better chance of beating Hogan than Bruno. So whatever the number of days is for Luger, I'll go with that. I just don't remember offhand how many how many days he was the uh, champ. Hey, Gabe Sanchez, thank you for the five. Eating a sub and drinking a Jack Daniels Tennessee apple just for you. Ooh, that sounds great. I don't think I've actually tried the uh, Tennessee apple. That is very good. Uh, Christopher Smith with the $10 super chat. Chris, thank you. Since Mania, Cody lost... Brock hasn't explained. Raw Women's Champion on SmackDown. SmackDown Women's Champion on Raw. Same design title. Charlotte in the Bank. All you can do is laugh. Don't forget Logan in the Bank. For Monday night. Yeah, I mean, it's again, you take the Bloodline stuff out. Has WWE television really been, really been good since WrestleMania? Can you objectively say that WWE television has been good since WrestleMania, without the Bloodline stuff. Uh, we have got Bobby's World again. With that final uh, $5. We have got Rizzo wants to know, with how petty WWE, or more accurately, Vince can be, do you think Lacey's downfall is because of Ric Flair's comments about how Lacey did not like the storyline with or like you, am I reading too much into something? I think you're reading too much. Into it. I think you're reading too much into it. Lacey just, she's just not that good. You know, it's a very, very um, cliche character that she's portraying. She's got a presence about her and a confidence about her, but just her matches, you know, generally they're just not good. There's nothing compelling. I mean, there, it's a weird thing because her actual life story, her story is compelling. And they tried to tell that. And remember they did the five or six part series with her? Remember that whole debacle? How many weeks in a row of Lacey just in front of a screen telling her life story? And then she started repeating herself over again. And then they put her out there and then they moved her to another show. They completely dropped the ball and fucked that whole thing up. So her actual life story is pretty compelling, but this character is just fucking like 1980s. Even even for the 1980s, it would have been just kind of like, you know, basic bullshit. There's just nothing interesting about it. Her matches aren't good. Lacey is just, she's just there. She just sort of exists. She doesn't really, there's no, there's no life to her. There's no life to the character. So that has more to do with her lack of success than anything else you know all the start and stops before when they tried to push her did a lot of damage from heel the baby face her baby face to heel whatever it was they wanted her to be one thing she ended up being another the whole thing was completely fucked up they they fucked the whole thing up with her and she's never recovered from that which just goes to show you that you know bad booking can do some lasting severe damage that was certainly the case with her. Uh, Drehund, long time no see. Yes, indeed. 
Thank you again for the uh, 25 spot. Charlotte has all those title reigns, and I don't remember a single one. <laughs> also, I'm on a flight to Portland my first time on the West Coast. Going to be starting or starring in a film. Wish me luck. Oh, very cool, Dre. You have to uh, let me know what what the uh, nature of the film is. How come I wasn't called for a cameo? Just saying. Hey, you know, you're on your way to Portland. We got the Portland pop star waiting for you. Paul Hamilton, man. He's going to show you the town. You should have let Paul know. Going to Portland. I mean, come on. You got you got to see Paul. Red Emissary of Darkness. I, What does that say? Oh, I thought that said something different. I farted, but I crapped myself. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. But thank you for the two bucks. Uh, pillow v. Pillow. Why isn't June 19th recognized as Rey Mysterio Day? I don't know. Is there a joke in there that I'm missing? Red Emissary of Darkness. Mr. Monster, may I go to the bathroom? No, you may not. You've got to hold it in. I'm sorry. Whatever whatever didn't come out, you got to hold the rest in. Dennis Diaz with a super chat. Thank you, Dennis. Chris AXC with Logan Paul's addition to Money in the Bank. And you see him stealing a victory from LA Knight to win the case and set off a Knight Paul program for SummerSlam. I can see Logan Paul winning Money in the Bank, yes. If he wins Money in the Bank, is he going to feud with LA Knight? No. But I can definitely see him winning Money in the Bank. Naughty Delicious Chicken with Flavor. Smackdown tonight is like having macaroni salad, egg salad, and cheese crackers. Hey, macaroni salad is good. I don't know why you uh, would be beefing on macaroni salad. Egg salad is just the fucking worst. Oh my god. Just the stench of egg salad used to make me gag. It's cheese crackers. Not for me. No, no, no cheese for me anymore. Goonthar or Gunthar. Magnificent. All hail Gunthar. Gunthar doesn't like cheese crackers either. It just it doesn't it doesn't agree with his system. It's the only Achilles heel that Gunthar has. If you give Gunthar dairy, it's uh, not a good situation for him. Uh, who was that? Was that Prime Time? I believe it was. Hey, Prime Time, thank you for the fifty dollar Gunthar bomb here on a Friday night. All hell. All hail the mighty one himself. Uh, Naughty Delicious also says Kenny Omega will blank the IWGP US heavyweight title. Uh, eat. He will eat the IWGP US heavyweight title and Jim Cornette will have an aneurysm. Oh, better yet, he'll wrestle the IWGP US title. He'll take bumps for the IWGP US title and Cornette will do a 25 minute rant on his YouTube channel. That's what I predict. Alex Silva, if Randy comes back after SummerSlam, will he be a free agent? Go from show to show? Who should be his first few? Him and Cody would be a great story. Yeah, I think him and Cody would be a, a great world championship feud once Cody wins the title. I, w I wouldn't jump into that one right away. I would hold off on that one a little bit. Look, I think if he comes back, he's going to be on the same brand with Riddle. I think they're going to want to wrap up the whole RK Bro thing. That, that thing can still make them some money and sell some merch. And then you can do a turn. You could have Randy turn on him, him turn on Randy. So I still think there's some, some mileage left in the RK Bro stuff before you just totally blow it off. Christopher Smith, besides Gunther, who is being built towards the main event? They have no one else being built, even though they have people they can invest in. Well, LA Knight, I think, is certainly someone that they can uh, push into a top-tier spot, I think. He's certainly a top-tier talker. We know how much they value that. They value personality, charisma, verbal skills. Uh, in the ring, he's fine. You know, the, I mean, he's not an overly dynamic in-ring performer. He's not bouncing around the ring doing fancy stuff. But, you know, he can work. He can talk. He kind of checks all the boxes off. He should be pushed at a high level. He's not a world champion. He should be pushed in that same realm. There's no reason he can't be in the same conversation right now with people like AJ Styles or Lashley uh, or any of the other people, Sheamus, who we see getting television main events. At some point, that should be him. Uh, Damian Priest, I would counter by saying I think Priest is being built. 
Um, it's a slow burn type of thing, but clearly they're building to some kind of split in the Judgment Day on Raw. I think Priest is going to go babyface. I think Priest is... When I look at Money in the Bank, and I'm going to do Money in the Bank predictions on Sunday on the podcast, um, especially because I'm not streaming next Friday, the, the, the night before, so I'll just do them on the podcast on Sunday. But... Logan Paul and LA Knight are going to get the most talk going into next weekend as far as potential winners of the briefcase. Damian Priest is on that list as well. Because remember, the winner of Money in the Bank does not have to cash in on the World Heavyweight title or the Undisputed title, which isn't really undisputed. The winner can cash in. You know, the precedent has already been set. And we're back. We had a little hiccup there, but we're back. What I was saying is the precedent has already been set from last year when Austin Theory won Money in the Bank. And what did he do? He cashed in to try to win the United States Championship. And I have floated the idea before that when the time comes for Gunther to lose the Intercontinental title, he'll break the record first. Damian Priest should be in the conversation of people who beat Gunther. To win the Intercontinental Championship. I think the direction they're going in with him is as a top babyface. I think they see him in that role going forward. I think, again, they, they value him very much. They put him in a spot at Backlash with Bad Bunny. That was a very big spot. He knocked it out of the park. He's been doing some very good work. So don't count him out as a potential winner for Money in the Bank. And somebody who could challenge Gunther for the title once he's already broken the record and it's safe to take the title off of him uh, Priest is going to be somebody to look at so I, I would argue that they are building Priest but I agree I mean there there are more people that they should be building I mean you know LA Knight is not the, the only one there's a lot of very talented people on this roster um, you know there's the potential for more NXT call ups like a Braun Breaker I think with him again you take your time with him and once he gets called up, he starts running through people on the main roster. You put one of the secondary titles on him. You build him up to an eventual main event spot. Because I, I think he'll be a main eventer within a few years in that company on the main roster. Uh, Naughty Delicious says CM Punk against blank at All In. CM Punk... At all in, I, I'm not sure that he'll be in a singles match. I could see him being in a multi-man match with FTR. I mean, we, we know the match that uh, a lot of people want to see. Whether it's going to happen or not, probably not, but I suppose anything's possible. If CM Punk was in a singles match, though, we never did get that Punk and Brian Danielson match in AEW. I know Punk wanted to work with him again. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Punk, Punk and Danielson would be good, but I think Danielson, uh, you know, he may want to work with somebody maybe he's never been in the ring with before. I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm imagining Punk probably in a, in a multi-man match. If they were smart, they would go with my idea which is to do CM Punk and Samoa Joe. And I, I talked about that on Wednesday with the Owen, right? They're, they're going to go to the semifinals. They're going to do Punk and Joe. I'd have Joe beat Punk. And then keep that going. Eventually, Punk has got to get that win over Samoa Joe. Maybe he gets it at All In. Maybe he gets it at Wembley. Maybe he gets it in Chicago at All Out. Punk and Joe? Punk and Joe is probably what I would do. Uh, Rizzo, I always get excited for the podcast, but this Sunday it's even more. The Meltzer AEW crap he keeps spreading, in your opinion, on uh, if doing was murdered? Murdered, you say? I'll let you know right now. Um, I, I, my comments on that are going to be very brief. Because I'm going to be going through uh, Forbidden Door predictions and some other news and notes. Uh, I'm going to... It's going to be very brief. Uh, I'm I'm exhausted. Uh, I'm so beyond exhausted from all of the CM Punk, Elite, 
now someone's in a bad mood uh, 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 an anonymous star was like who gives a fuck who gives a fuck what mood this person was in this person's in a bad I'm in a bad mood every fucking day I don't see people reporting on it I mean please is this what is this what it's come to Someone's in a bad mood now, and now that makes news. Enough. Winston Slip. Most honest man in podcasting. Thank you for the hard work. I'll try my best. Thank you, Winston. Thank you very much, Winston. EJ Slam, would you like to see a Dark Side of the Ring episode on Eddie Gilbert? I think that would be a fascinating episode. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that. By the way, if uh, you missed it, the episode of Dark Side of the Ring this week was on Matt Bourne, the original Doink the Clown. And I have a full review. I have a lot to say about that episode. What was on there, what was not on there. So that will be part of episode 814 on Sunday. So if you like the Dark Side of the Ring stuff, then you'll enjoy this. And uh, Silver Tower, I just uh, looked over in the chat and I see Silver Tower has gifted five channel memberships. Too sweet to be sour, it's Silver Tower. Silver Tower once again flexing his muscle. you love to see it. Thank you for the five gifted and welcome to our five new members, including Ray Wright. And I don't know if Ray's actually with us live tonight. Oh, she'll be happy about that. Ray, I think Ray might, was Ray not a member already? Maybe her membership lapsed. Anyway, thank you, Silver Tower. Prime time with the $50 super chat from uh, 10 minutes ago. The fact that WWE has nothing for Drew Bobby and Theory is ridiculous. Love the Bloodline story, but they need to focus on the rest of the roster. Also, what is your song as Hog Commissioner? My song, my entrance music. I have an I have an entrance theme. You know you've made it when you have an entrance theme. And I have a Titan Tron too, Bob. So there's no mistaking who it is when I come at it. It says right there, Commissioner Solomon. It's right there. Boom, right there. Uh, tooth and Nail. A song by Foreigner from uh, back in the 80s called Tooth and Nail. Very good song. But uh, prime time, you make a great point. Theory is the United States champion. Boy, what the fuck has happened to Austin Theory? My God. My God. What has happened to Austin Theory? Set up for a big win at WrestleMania over John Cena, and it meant absolutely nothing. It meant dick. It meant not a single thing. He is less over and less visible on television now than he was two months ago. They wasted a John Cena match at WrestleMania. Way to go. Good job. Brandon Vasquez, buy, rent, and sell Logan in the bank, Charlotte in the bank, and Goldberg in the bank. <laughs> I forgot about Goldberg in the bank. Every time Goldberg would show up, he kept getting universal title matches or WWE title matches. I, I'd like to sell on all of them if I can. Is that is that allowed? I guess if you force me to rank them, I mean, Logan, Logan in the bank, Lo, Logan Paul being added to Money in the Bank does give the match some, some star power. And it's the first time he's done this so it's not really a pattern with him like it is Charlotte or, or Goldberg. I'll buy on Logan in the bank. And, uh, I mean, I guess I'll rent on Goldberg in the bank since, at least with him, it was only a couple of times, maybe. And, you know, Charlotte in the bank is just completely ridiculous. It, it's just, it's an insult. It's lazy. And it's stupid.
Chadwick. Chadwick, are you talking about the theory stuff? He goes, hey, Solo, let it play out. Just kidding. Yeah, we got to let it play out, everybody. Maybe there's a longer play here with Austin Theory that we're not aware of. We got to let it play out. In the meantime, the U.S. title is basically being held hostage. I'll tell you what, that U.S. title would look good on L.A. Knight. Dr. Scorpio, I was wondering how did you convince Charles Mason to do the Dancing Hollow Man intro? That is not Charles Mason. I would never work with that man. That man is an asshole. That man has made my life hog very difficult so far, but uh, no. That is not Charles Mason. Charles Mason, you will, you will never see him here on one of these streams. That I can promise you. Charles Mason has his hands full, by the way. You like what I did at the last Hog Show? When I announced his opponent for our big high-intensity show, High Intensity 10, coming up in August. He's going to have to put his title on the line against Eddie Kingston. We got the Mad King coming back into House of Glory. Let's see, let's see Mason hold on to his championship now. Let's see him hold on to his title now. Uh, Rizzo, damn spell check, I met Doink. Uh, well, what did you say? I don't even remember what you said. Um... Oh, okay. Yeah, I, w I was wondering what that was in reference to. So in his last Super Chat, he said, My opinion on if doing was murdered. <laughs> he meant doink. Um, I I'm going to talk about that on Sunday as part of the review for the people who don't know what you're talking about. Uh, no, I, I, I don't believe he was murdered. I can see why his daughter might think that, but no, I, I don't believe he was. Yeah, you know, that the sort of thing happens when you are hardcore into drugs and alcohol for your entire life, and your heart is six times the normal size that it should be. You're basically a ticking time bomb, and I know it's difficult, maybe for the people who are close to him to say. God, I can't imagine something like this would happen. The guy was a drug addict. He was a drug addict who had a, who had a heart that was 710 grams in size, okay? It's not that difficult to believe that he would have died. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult for friends and family to accept. As an outside observer who didn't know him, and I watched the story, and I listened to what happened, and I watched what happened... It ain't that surprising that he was going to fucking die. The shit that he was doing and that he was putting in his body, it was bound to happen. So no, I don't believe he was murdered. If, if, if anyone did the murdering, it was him. Uh, Paul Carpenter, this just in, Solomonster is now in a bad mood. How did you know? Hey, Nemo, thank you for the sub. Uh, Naughty Delicious says, I can't wait for the G1 Climax. That's right, G1 is coming up in a few weeks. Three weeks, I believe. Kevin Kelly is going to miss probably a month's worth of collision shows because he's heading back to Japan for the G1. Alex Silva, I love LA Knight, but the name still doesn't do it for me. Being named after a hockey team, I don't know. Personally, I like his Eli Drake name in Impact. Well, maybe he wanted to be Eli Drake, but we know how those things go in WWE when it comes to names. You know, not everybody can bring their name over. You know, if you're an AJ Styles or somebody like that, it's it's, it's like you're grandfathered in. Eli Drake, he just didn't have the stroke. I guess that an AJ Styles did. Rizzo, and sorry for the Meltzer Super Chat that unleashed angry soul. Quite all right. I was not uh, unleashed on you. Yeah, you know, it, LA Knight being named after a hockey team. I, I thought it was a playoff uh, LA gear, the sneakers. I used to have a pair of LA gears when I was a kid. I think those were the light up ones, right? The, the ones with the lights on the side. I, I thought that that was some kind of LA gear reference. Am I wrong? Is it a hockey team reference? Dr. Scorpio, watch Mason somehow find a way to escape again. 
I don't know, man. Some, somehow he always finds a way to slip away and hold on to that title. It's very disappointing because, you know, uh, when, when I was hired to be the commissioner of House of Glory, my first order of business was to put an end to this Charles Mason uh, title run. Now he's been champion for over a year. He's like fucking Roman Reigns of House of Glory, this guy. And uh, he keeps evading all of these situations and cheating to win. You know, I, I didn't point this out, but it was kind of interesting. You know, he he had a match with uh, Vikingo. We had Vikingo making his hog debut at our last show last week. And it was Mason defending his title against Vikingo. And, of course, he, you know, brought weapons into the ring and got himself disqualified and... You know, he was about to do some real damage to Vikingo with that chair, with, with a steel chair. And that's when I came out to stop him and make the announcement about the next show. I came out, I had to come out and save Vikingo. So I don't know how many of you had that on your bingo card for 2023, that Solomonster would make the save for Vikingo, but now you can say that Solomonster made the save for Vikingo. So there you go. You never know. You never know what's going to happen at one of these shows. Who knows what the rest of this year might hold? But if I do nothing else for the rest of my uh, career in Hog, if I do nothing else for the rest of my life, you could always say that Solomonster made the save for Vikingo. So there you go. Juan Ocampo, LA Knight is basically getting Ms. Dow slash Zack Ryder. Let's wait until Money in the Bank before we make that uh, determination. And Nier. Nier says, what's next for the Usos after the Bloodline? I can see Jimmy turning on Jay eventually. No, I, th I think that would be a terrible idea. I, I think the Usos, you know, you got two brothers, one turning on the other. It it we're not talking Brett and Owen here. Um, you know, Jimmy and Jay have had issues with each other during the storyline. Doing a full-on split between them, though. Not that I can't see... You know, for example, Jay having some singles success, but the brothers breaking up, I, I don't see that happening. I, I don't think that would be a good idea. As far as what they do after the bloodline, I do what they always do. They're going to go back after the tag team titles. But I could see Jay doing more single stuff and winning a singles title as well. Maybe a uh, singles mid-card title. I could see that. Jey Uso is a U.S. champion one day or something like that. Anyway, the goal tonight for Be The Booker was 400, and you guys smashed the goal. Look at that. How about that? Even on a slow night. Even on a slow night with a boring SmackDown. We have exceeded our goal tonight. Let me tell you, you guys have been bringing the heat tonight with the Super Chats, too. I, I didn't think that was going to happen. I said, man, this is going to be a dead night. You guys have come through. You've made this night a happy night here on the uh, Sala Monster channel. Don't forget, by the way, Fight Forever. Fight Forever is less than a week away, if you can believe it, after all these years. The game is dropping next Thursday. I can't believe this day has finally arrived. Now we just have to hope the game is not a dud once it drops. I hope it has some I hope it has a decent enough story mode to it. I've been hearing conflicting things about story mode. Not not very encouraging, but uh I guess we'll find out. But anyway, we smashed the goal. It is time. I want to see those emojis in the chat. It is time to be the booker. Here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now I don't know time what I was waiting for there. I was waiting for something. Booker. I was waiting for something there. I don't know. I had, a, I had a, a little little freeze up there. I don't know what that was. Uh, no, I'm not getting it on Switch. I'm getting it on Steam. Play these games on the uh, computer. So uh, we'll we'll do at least one or two. I don't know if it'll be a whole series or not. I have to see how how interesting and fun the game is first. But we will do some sound of gamer on the uh, fight forever again. And I am not done. Just for those who were asking, I am not done with the two K twenty three gamers. I just did not have any time. I was away on business this week, out of state for a few days. 
now we are heading into a very busy weekend and then another very busy week so i will get to it when i get to it but right now let's get to this let's get to be the booker how about that how about that we kick things off with Tommaso Ciampa, the same Tommaso Ciampa who made his return to the ring first time in nine months on Monday night. There you go. Tommaso Ciampa looking in uh, good shape, too, for someone who had some pretty serious hip problems. Came back looking like a beast on Monday night. Tommaso Ciampa going to go one-on-one -on -one with Bill Goldberg. <laughs> giving that the bell because Tommaso Ciampa is going to give old Billy Boy over here the fairy tale ending. He's going to drop him right on his head. Look kind of similar too, right? With the uh, the beard and the bald head. Bill Goldberg and Tommaso Ciampa. There you go. Maybe that'll be Goldberg's retirement match when uh, Ciampa drops him with the fairy tale ending. Future AEW legend Bill Goldberg. I think you may be right. All right, women's be the booker here. We begin with Indy Hartwell, former NXT women's champion. Called up to the main roster. Has not been seen in... How long has it been since we've seen Indy Hartwell on Raw? She got drafted to Raw. Now she, I know she was hurt. So is it just a case where she's still injured or... I didn't think the injury was that serious that she would be gone for months and months. But even if she's hurt, doesn't mean you can't do character work with her on TV. She made a couple of appearances and she vanished. She vanished. Indy Hartwell going to go one-on-one -on -one with my hole. It's Nia Jax's hole, everybody. Oh, no. Oh, no. Indy Hartwell lost in Nia's hole. Remember that show, uh, Press Your Luck? Old game show? And you wanted to make sure no matter what, that you didn't land on a whammy. So you'd say, no whammy, no whammy. Well, this is the whammy, right? Naya's hole is one of the whammies in Be the Booker. Well, while Indy tries to fish her way out of Naya's hole, we go to the tag team Be the Booker to try to break the tie. We had one bell, we had one buzzer, and now we've got Proud and Powerful, Santana and Ortiz. <laughs> you like the visual? I'm glad you enjoy it. I'm glad you enjoy it. Santana and Ortiz. Santana should be coming back soon. The only question is, will he and Ortiz reunite? Because apparently they had a falling out. We haven't seen Ortiz in a while. I have a feeling that these two are going to be better off together than they would be apart. So hopefully they can work out their issues. But Santana and Ortiz are going to be stepping into the ring with... Get back here. Going to be stepping into the ring with who? Who? Who will it be? Drum roll, let's find out who. Proud and powerful, taking on The Undertaker and Kane. I don't think that'll end well for Proud and Powerful, but I think that could be a good match. What do you think? Santana and Ortiz against the Brothers of Destruction. Look at these two badasses here. Got their sledgehammers. It'd be scary enough without sledgehammers, let alone with sledgehammers. That is a hell of a match. I like that match. Santana and Ortiz, Undertaker and King. There you go. There's, there's your Be the Booker for Friday night. That's why we do Be the Booker, so we can book matches like that that make you think what would have happened if those two teams would have locked horns in the ring. What kind of match would those teams have had? What kind of match could Indy Hartwell have pulled out of Nia's hole? What 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 other objects, perhaps, could she have pulled out of Nia's hole? I'll let you dwell on that as you put your head on the pillow tonight to go to sleep. Daniel Malcolm, how would you feel about Jay pinning Roman at Money in the Bank? 
Um, I don't like it. I still, I still believe Roman should not be pinned until he drops the championships. He has not been pinned since 2019. I don't think that he should be pinned until the night that he drops the belts. I still feel that way. Hey, T, T Rivera, man. Oh, you know, I'm going to go to hell for laughing at that, but that was, that was pretty funny. Uh, hey, Warhawk Rambo just renewed his channel membership. Been a member for four months. Hey, Warhawk, thank you. Dr. Scorpio was thinking about getting the AEW game, but then I saw they were remaking Mario RPG for the Switch and decided to save up for the Switch. So excited. Are they? Are they remaking? I, I didn't know about that. I have the Switch, so. <laughs> I might consider that. Is it just the Switch, or are they doing it for other platforms as well? And Rizzo. Coming in with a $5 super chat. With that image now, I am in a bad mood. Well, good. Why should I be the only one? Why should I be the only miserable one? Why can't you be miserable with me? Now we can all be miserable and commiserate together. Oh, they are. So, so they, so... Okay, so they're remaking the game for Switch. Well, but yeah, but my question was, it, so it's just Switch. It's not for any other, any other, okay, Nintendo only. All right. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. AEW not putting the tag team titles on Proud and Powerful was a major missed opportunity. Yeah, I mean, they just became background noise, you know, for Chris Jericho and his group. Kind of what, what's happened with Daniel Garcia in the JAS. That's what happened to Santana and Ortiz in the inner circle. What was a good spot for them originally ended up working against them in the end. Juan Ocampo says, this just in, I am mad at Solo. It is, it is Mario, not Mario. Well, here in New York, it's Mario. You don't like it. Too bad. Want me to say Mario to make you all happy? A silver tower just came in with a $40, $30, $30, bully the clown. Too sweet to be sour. It's, it's silver, silver tower. tower. Silver tower. Thank you, sir. He says we need more bully the clown in our lives. Well, thanks to you. We now can say that we had bully the clown making his cameo here on the SmackDown stream. So now we feel more complete. With bully making an appearance. Naughty delicious chicken with flavor. It says Santana and Ortiz against Kane and Undertaker. Winner gets to hang out with the Solo Monster at the bar. I know what Undertaker is drinking. He's drinking Jack. The problem is he's probably drinking it straight, right from the bottle. I gotta have the Jack. I gotta do like Jack and Coke. There's gotta be some kind of secondary uh component to this can't do it straight i can't do it straight the drink that is silver tower man of the hour says neil indeed silver tower is the man of the hour so we will find out on on uh, collision tomorrow night and again there will be no collision stream i am i'm not going to be here but um, tomorrow night, I will watch Collision at some point, and I will save my thoughts and my review for the podcast on Sunday. So I guess you'll have to listen to the flagship show if you want to know what I thought of the show. But we will find out tomorrow night who the 
mystery partner is at Forbidden Door for Sting and Darby Allen. I'm still going to say uh, Naito is probably the leading candidate. I know there's been talk about Goldberg. I think Tony Khan shot that down flat out uh, at the media scrum the other day. So I assume it's not Goldberg. If it was, I think he would probably just tap dance around the question. He would have given one of his classic evasive answers but he flat out said he didn't think Goldberg would be a good a good fit for their partner in that match so if we put old uh, Billy Boy on the side I still think Naito is probably the leading candidate or maybe it's Toriano what do you think what, 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 what if it's Yano eh, I don't think that's the right spot for Yano watch, watch it be uh... <laughs> who was it oh my gosh um Muda. After all, oh, he had like six retirement matches at the beginning of the year. Watch Muda come out of retirement to be their fucking partner. Because it was Sting, Darby, and Muda at the uh, Great Muda Retirement Show in January. I would just laugh if it ends up being Muda. After all the retirements this year, he ends up coming back a few months later. Muda, Muda is not New Japan. Muda is not a member of the New Japan roster, so that really wouldn't make much sense. But uh, yeah, I would I would laugh. Shingo, you know, Shingo would not be a bad choice either. It's kind of uh, a bummer that he's not included on the show. I wouldn't mind Shingo. Honestly, I I think I'd I I would go with Shingo over Naito if it were me. That's probably what I would do. Muda is doing the Terry Funk. He's been doing the Terry Funk run now for years. Straight from the bottle is the best, says Boots. You be doing your drinking out of a brown paper bag, aren't you? Yeah, you are. You're out on the sidewalk drinking out of a brown paper bag. I know you. Papa Shingo. Who said that? Who said Papa Shingo? Who was it? Wasn't Shingo their partner last year? I believe so. That's why I, I could also see it being him. It's a swerve. It's Goldberg. Ugh. Ugh. Too bad Mercedes got hurt. I'm sure not only would she have been on the show, it probably would have been her against Tony Storm instead of Willow. But, you know, when when in, with injury comes opportunity, I'm glad to see Willow getting a, a spot on the show. You know, good for her. Willow is, I think Willow's great. Juan says, I will be smoking my first brisket next week with a fifth of Jack and some Coke to keep me company. I like it. Said I can't have any. <laughs> Powdered or liquid? Why not both? They said it was from Jericho's past. That's right. It's like the ghost of Jericho's past. That's why I think... Naito, he had two matches with Naito. And Naito does not, doesn't have a role on the show. Fucking Tom Lawler has a match on the show. Filthy Tom Lawler has a match now. He's wrestling Adam Cole on Sunday, but Naito doesn't have a match. Uh, how long will Mercedes be out? She's been very coy about this. The only thing we know is that she put, put a picture up last week, I believe. Uh, at home, her foot was all wrapped up as if she had surgery. So I still say there's a chance she could be on the show, even if she's on crutches, just to make an appearance. Uh, but if she had surgery, then she's, you know, she's probably done for at least two or three months. If she had ankle surgery. I would, I would hope that she can uh, get well before uh, Wembley. Maybe she could be on the Wembley Stadium show. Isn't Ralphus dead? Yes, Ralphus is dead.
Yeah, Ralph has passed away many years ago. So on Sunday, episode 814 of the podcast is going to have a full rundown of the Forbidden Door card with all of my predictions. I'll be talking about the Owen Hart tournaments, both the men's and women's. I'll have some thoughts on all the latest CM Punk news, but I promise I will keep it brief because even I have just grown exhausted with all of this uh, punk nonsense. Punk and the elite. My God. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, Money in the Bank predictions as well. Full Dark Side of the Ring review on the Doink the Clown episode. And Sunday is, uh, well, yes, today's the 24th. Tomorrow, tomorrow Sunday, is the anniversary of the uh, Benoit tragedy. And uh, I know somebody sent in a question that I will include in the mailbag, just uh, touching upon that. So that is a, a somber anniversary, but that, I, want, I believe it was 17 years ago this weekend, 17 years ago on Sunday. Although I guess it happened over the course of an entire weekend, not just in one day, but uh, there'll be much to talk about on the podcast on Sunday. Sunday night will be the next time I'm live with you on YouTube. I'm sure it'll be very late, but when Forbidden Door is over, uh, you guys can come on back here. There's our uh, little GWO logo here. But uh, what I was going to show you is that the Forbidden Door review will be on Sunday night, live. As soon as the pay-per-view is over, you come on back here. We'll talk all about it. Two huge matches. Kenny Omega, Will Ospreay for the IWGP US title. And of course, what could be the match of the century? Brian Danielson for the first time ever one-on-one. -on -one with Kazuchika Okada. Two of the very best, not only in the world, but two of the very best of all time. Two of the best of their generation for the first time ever. That match alone sells this pay-per-view for me. So that'll be uh, coming up on Sunday night, and then, of course, uh, live again with you on Monday night. After Monday Night Raw, we get to do this all over again, heading into the final week I believe, is this the uh, final week of, of June coming up next week? I believe it is. I believe it is. All right, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, we, I think, had more fun on this stream than most of us had watching the actual television show tonight. That's usually how it tends to work. That usually happens uh, more often than it should, I feel like. But thank you for keeping me company. I hope you guys have a great weekend. Again, uh, I will see you back here on Sunday night. It'll be a busy weekend. So until then, be well, stay safe, and uh, we'll do it all over again for the Forbidden Door. As the door is opened. I see it. I see Okada. I see Danielson. It's close. It's close. Keep those men under lock and key. I don't want to hear that somebody got in an accident in a taxi cab on their way to the building. I don't want to hear that somebody slipped on a, a fucking sheet of ice up there in Toronto. I don't want to hear that uh, somebody got COVID. Nothing should stand in the way of this match on Sunday. Nothing. I'm very adamant about this. I'm going to be very upset if something happens to ruin this match. A deputy dog, Brock, Primetime, Darth, Silver Tower. Thank you for all the love and support, guys. See you back here soon.